Hola a todos. Uh, welcome, everybody. It is my great pleasure to introduce the first colloquium speaker of, of this year, Camille Apache Uh Camille obtained her PhD from the Sorbonne in Paris while working with uh, Stefan Charlo. A thesis dealt with constraining the physical parameters of galaxies using different types of observation. Um, she has held postdoc positions in Heidelberg and in Yonsei in Korea before she moved to Baltimore as a NASA postdoctoral program fellow and then as a postdoc at SDSCI. She is currently uh, there as an instrument scientist for JWST NERIS uh, instrument with the Canadian Space Agency. Um, she has studied the formation and evolution of galaxies uh, nearby and at high redshift as well as the history and evolution of star formation in these objects. So today she's going to tell us about her work on updating uh, star formation histories of galaxies using SED libraries. So let's all welcome Cam. Thank you, Sundar. Thank you very much. And thank you everybody for being here today. I'm honored to be the first <laughs> colloquium speaker for your semester. Um, as Sundar mentioned, I'm an instrument scientist now, so I don't get to I don't get to have a lot of science time. Uh, I get only 30%, uh, but I get to work with very nice students, very uh, um, actually awesome students. So I'll show you some of the work that I've been doing in the past couple of years and the work that um, a few students uh, have done as well. And, and I'll tell you also a little bit about the other 70% of my work for GWC. And apologies for not sharing my, my screen. Sundar will drive the slides today. Um, so please, next slide. This is the outline, just to uh, give you a brief idea of what we will see in the next um, hours, well, the next about 40 minutes. So the big question behind all the work I've been doing uh, for, uh, for my science is how do galaxies form and evolve? So I'll dive a little bit into that. Uh, then my bread and butter is actually modeling galaxy SEDs, galaxy spectral energy distributions to interpret the data. So I'll go ahead, um, talk about that a little bit as well. And I'll talk about why um, we should build complex and comprehensive models of galaxies SEDs now uh, with, the, with the data we have now. My favorite topic is star formation history reconstructions, as also Sundar mentioned. So I'll talk about that too. And the bonus track is my work for JWST, which is related to the JWST data analysis tools that we're developing at STSCI. Uh, next slide. So how do galaxies form and evolve? Let's uh, dive into that. We see galaxies of different shapes. You all know that, um, different forms, different um, activity. And um, we, we know some, on how galaxies transition from uh, one type to the other. But we also have still many unknowns on how we turn a beautiful spiral galaxy into something that looks more like a red potato. Uh, go. So we see a bimodality in properties. We see a bimodality in color, in star formation activity, in morphologies, you can see. Um, and there are different ways galaxies can move from uh, the blue cloud where they are start forming to the red sequence where they end their life. And one, one way could be that they, they go up to the red sequence in color space early in their life and then they keep living there. So they have an early quenching of star formation. Next, they could um, leave a much longer portion of their life in the uh, in a star forming phase and then move up to uh, the red sequence and uh, co compared to the age of the universe spend little time there or they can have their ups and downs these are what i call the ups and downs of galaxies they can move up and down um, change their status more often and not just have one transition next so just uh, um, to repeat again, we see this, this evolution, we see this change in morphology and kinematics in star formation activity, and we know what are the mechanisms. But we don't have yet the full picture of when each of these mechanisms happen and how it happens, and if the characteristic of these specific mechanisms are different if they happen at early red, at um, high redshift or at low redshift. Next. So we can answer this question in two ways. 
we can connect galaxies observed at different epochs and infer how galaxies evolve in a global way, in a statistical way, or we can interpret the light of galaxies and infer their individual formation histories from the fossil records in their data. Next. And uh, to give you a picture of the difference between the two, um, I have an, um, an analogy uh, for how we infer the growth of galaxies from the, the global population. Next. Um, we can look at galaxies, uh, pictures of galaxies like we look at pictures of people. So we could see a family in the 1920s, next in the 1950s, next in the 70s, and next in the 2000s. So we, there is a lot of value in looking at these pictures because we see the environment of these galaxies, of these people. We, we see their properties. Next. But like these four galaxies, these four women have absolutely nothing to do with each other. So connecting their properties for individual galaxies is, is not very meaningful. Connecting, connecting properties for samples of galaxies is more meaningful, but it's complicated because the samples can be radically different. And a, a, per, a sample or a person could not could be uh, not very representative of the sample of that specific population at a certain age. For example, Queen Elizabeth is not necessarily representative of a normal grandmother. Next, next slide. So uh, we can do, uh, we can have a different approach, although there is a lot of value in the first approach. With the data we have now, we can also take this different approach that is infer um, the formation history from for individual galaxies from the fossil records in their data. Next. And we can do that because we know what galaxies are made of, we know their components, and we know um, how these components shine. So we know that galaxies are made of young stars and gas. We know that they're made of old stars. We know that there is dust. That, that absorbs light and that re-emits light. Next. And we know that all these components uh, shine at different wavelengths. So we can have a global picture of a galaxy and have uh, a global picture of the history of the galaxy from the fossil records. For example, this is an SDSS galaxy seen from the ultraviolet to the far infrared. And you can see how different are these pictures uh, in the ultraviolet uh, you see really the brightest, uh, most massive, um, youngest stars, and then you go to the optical where you see more older stars or the nebular emission if we look at emission lines. And then we go to the infrared that is complementary with the UV where you see what the dust has absorbed because dust is absorbed and re-emits in the, in the infrared. Next slide. So my bread and butter, modeling galaxy SEDs to interpret the data. And this is necessary. Uh, it's, it is necessary that the way we model galaxy it can reproduce a wide range of observables, so can reproduce what we want to uh, interpret. So there are a few ingredients next that are needed um, to build model spectral energy distributions of galaxies. We need to model the star formation and chemical enrichment histories of the galaxy galaxies, then we need to include the contribution by the stars and by the gas, and then we need to include the effect of dust. Next. So the first in ingredient is my favorite topic, and so I'll talk a little bit about this. It can be done in many different ways. Um, there is, uh, there are, we can model the self emission histories of galaxies in a parametric way, so using parametric functions. Uh, this is from the code bagpipes, if, if you know that. Uh, and these are uh, double power law functions. So the uh, a galaxy, will, this age of the universe uh, versus star formation rate. So you can see a galaxy starts by increasing the star formation rate, reaching a peak, and then the star formation rate decreases. If it's a quasi galaxies, it could also keep going on and stay on a um, on a growing um, star formation rate if it's still in an active phase. Um, 
Um, I'm intentionally not showing exponentially declining models because I think these are really not applicable for the universe beyond redshift zero, uh, where we can't really detect that growing phase because it's too early in the universe. Um, but there are other functions that are um, more, much more meaningful uh, to reproduce observations. We can have non-parametric functions and uh, which means talking about the star formation history is just in terms of beans of mass formed. Uh, so beans, beans in age and mass forms formed in these beans. And this is, for example, the work that uh, Priscilla Choke did in the legacy collaboration. I'm, I'm part of the legacy collaboration. I worked closely with her during her PhD. And, a legacy, for those who don't know, is a spectroscopic survey in the cosmos field done with the VLT. It's very deep um, and very long integrations. I shouldn't say very deep. It's very long integrations and it's colorblind. blind. So the sample is very large. It's about 3,000 galaxies in total. And it's galaxies at redshift about 0.8 with spectra at SDSS quality. So signal to noise of 20 or above. So there is really a lot of information in this high resolution, um, high signal to noise spectra. And, and Priscilla derived the star formation histories of these galaxies uh, using non-parametric functions. The other approach is to base the star formation histories from simulations. And now there are more and more simulations, much more, more and more advanced. And so we can use these simulations uh, as priors for our observations. And you can see this is an example, star formation rate and metallicity as a function of loop back time. So um, number uh, 10, 11, 12 giga years is back in the past and the zero is uh, redshift zero you can see that the galaxy star formation rate oscillates. It's just not a smooth function. It goes up and down and there are spikes. There are more uh, stable uh, periods, but it's definitely not describable as an analytic function. Um, and as a bonus with the star formation histories from simulations, we get also the metallicity history, which is very important because it's important to account for the fact that the first stars were actually metal poor and the last stars are more metal rich because the medium hasn't reached. Another, next, another um, uh, approach based on simulation is not just including the evolution of stars and gas, but also including the evolution of dust. And this is the work done by another student I worked with in the past few years, uh, Pipi Triani, uh, based in, in Melbourne. Um, and she took a semi analytical model and included into the semi-analytical model, dust formation and destruction. And you can see how, and, uh, how dust can evolve along with the star formation rate. Uh, you can see that some stars can be formed in stellar ejecta, some stars can grow in the ASM, and how these two uh, have, are, are more effective at different epochs. And, and in, the whole, in her whole thesis, um, she explores how dust formation destruction affects the star formation rate in terms of cooling and um, um, formation of um, a geometry. So next slide. This is about the star formation history. So it's, we, we can go beyond the general approach of taking analytic functions. We have a lot of options now. Uh, the second set of ingredients is the emission by the stars and the gas. And these are this is the basic uh, the basic ingredient that everybody always includes. Um, I want to stress on the fact that the, the emission by the gas is important. Next slide, because uh, the emission by the gas is reflected into emission lines, narrow emission lines, and the optical is full of narrow emission lines. And these narrow emission lines can um, can contaminate the flux even in broadband. Just, so this is an yeah, example of uh, quantifying the contamination so right in one of the HST bands, the F140, um, um, where uh, at redshift around one, the band is contaminated so by H alpha and, and uh, two, and then redshift around two is contaminated uh, by O3 and H beta. And you can see uh, this is a plot of the contamination in, in magnitudes, which we could uh, interpret as percentage as a function of stellar mass. And so the, the general uncertainty I mean, level for uh, good photometry is 5%. So 
above everything above that is not accounted in the uncertainty of the photometry so uh, for the majority of these stars especially at masses between 9 uh, 10 to the 9 and 10 to the 10 the emission lines are really contributing more than this five percent so it's important to account for this contribution as well when modeling a cd fitting next uh, the next uh, the last ingredient is the effect of dust next and i'll i'll talk a little bit uh, about why um, a two component dust model is important but first i'll show you what a two component dust model is so a two component dust model means that um the start the um the attenuation no, doesn't depend only on the amount of stars that are in the in the galaxy but also the age of the stars in a sense that young stars are still surrounded by their thick birth clouds. So their light is attenuated first by the thick birth clouds and then by the ISM and the interstellar medium. While old stars are oh, have already blown away their birth clouds, so they are attenuated only by the thin interstellar medium. And accounting for that, accounting for a two-component dust model, um, accounts for the different optical properties in, in the dust, the spatial distribution of the dust, and the galaxy orientation as well. Because when you're when a galaxy is a John, you see more the interstellar medium than the birth clouds. While if a galaxy is face on, you can see also the, the individual birth clouds. So the attenuation will be different. So this is the theoretical reason why a two-component dust model is more physical than a simple screen dust model. And next. Um, I worked with uh, two students uh, tackling the dust uh, topic in the past few years. One is Wei Chen Wang, who worked a uh, student at Johns Hopkins, working with Susan Cassing and myself. And uh, with a very simple approach, he showed how um, the, um, edge on and face on galaxies show different um, slopes of um, the UV for the same amount of dust. And this means that uh, the, um, the orientation of the galaxy uh, should be taken into account when modeling the dust law. And this could be done with a two component dust law. So if I will go a little bit in detail of this plot, you can see the IRX um, quantity. So the ratio between uh, the uh, emission uh, in the IR and the UV and the uh, UV slope beta. Yes. So you can see that edge on galaxies are the orange points. They are above the, uh, the purple points that are uh, face on galaxies. These are galaxies that are achieved about 1.5. And, and so it means that for the same IRX, for the same amount of dust, is a proxy for the amount of dust, the uh, UV slope is different. So the dust should be modeled in a different way. Next slide, another work that showed how the dust attenuation can be different and there can be a lot of scatter in the dust attenuation law uh, is from uh, Ivana Barizic uh, in last year work. Uh, she is also a student in the legacy collaboration like Priscilla and the approach taken here is completely different. Uh, here we took high resolution spectra and the first plot is an example of an observed legacy spectrum. We remove the continuum to make it um, uh, ignorant to the dust, uh, the dust extinction, uh, dust attenuation. Sorry. Uh, then we fit the the spectrum, the spectrum of these galaxies, um, pixel by pixel. So uh, with all the absorption features, we can get a good handle on the age and so on the star formation history of the galaxy. With that, we can have an intrinsic model SED is the third plot. So the best fit uh, model, uh, attenuation free model. So we take the best fit attenuation free model, which is the last, the last um, plot there, and we compare it with the observed photometry. The difference between the two is the actual attenuation law. Uh, good, next slide. And this, this slide shows all the galaxies and the average attenuation law from this sample. But you can see the variety of attenuation laws that uh, can be derived from this sample. And this is at Rachel point eight. Um, I, I believe it was about 200 galaxies. And so the, the attenuation law can be defined as a single law, but there is a large scatter and that large scatter should be taken into account when modeling the SEDs of galaxies. Next slide. So 
I gave you some reasons, but um, I want to give you more reasons. Why should I build such complicated models of galaxy spectral energy distributions? Next slide. Why? Many years ago, um, we were only observing local massive galaxies with few photometric measurements. And in this case, I agree that the simple modeling approach is totally enough. Next slide. But now we're observing local and high redshift galaxies, so, photometric measurements in so broad and narrow bands that can be heavily contaminated by specific features in the, in the galaxies. We can see a large wavelength range. We can have spectroscopic measurements along with the photometry. So with all these details in the, in the data, a simple modeling approach is just not enough anymore. And we need to use better models. Next slide. So uh, um, I'll show you work um, that is still in preparation now. It's, uh, it has been in preparation for a while, and the guilt is, is all on my side, but it's on the fact that I only have 30% time for science, so I need to wrap this up. But it was a very, in, um, very instructive exercise that we did a couple of years ago. We took 300 galaxies at Redshift 1, which is the sweet spot, because with the candles photometry, uh, the, the candles photometry, you can see the filters there, samples from the U, from U to IREC. And in, at Redshift 1, this observed frame is rest frame UV to near IR. So it's the perfect range that samples everything we, we need to see um, without including the IR, but ev everything we need to see in um, to see young stars, old stars, gas, dust. Um, so we took this sample and we gave it to um, a bunch of people who developed their own CD fitting codes. Next slide. Um, and they run their code in the best possible way. These are all state-of-the-art tools, which already include a lot of the ingredients I, I hammer a bit on in the past 10, 15 minutes. Uh, so we gave it to them, and they gave us back uh, their outputs. And we started comparing the outputs. Next slide. And we first saw uh, the generacies that we expected, but we first saw that. So these are in these are two galaxies. The first row and the second row are two galaxies. Uh, the first is really a highly degenerate galaxy in terms of parameter space, and the second is a more normal galaxy. So let's go through the highly degenerate one. Each point is the result in parameters for each code. And you see the first plot is stellar mass versus star formation rate. They are all more or less there. There is some range in star formation rate, but the uncertainties are um, sort of matching. When we go to dust attenuation versus stellar mass, so AV versus stellar mass, there is a large range of AV um, that these galaxies can span. This galaxy can span when the result is derived from different codes. And if we look at the last plot, which is AV versus star formation rate, we see clearly the degeneracy. So the same light for some codes is interpreted as uh, low star formation rate and low attenuation, and for some other is interpreted as high star formation rate and high attenuation. So this is a, a, a degeneracy in, in the data and how, in how it is handled in the codes. The other galaxy, the same plots, but you can see that is in more agreement. And the majority of the galaxies are like this second one, uh, but it's important to acknowledge the fact that there are degeneracies. Because then the, the I'm not, uh, this, this whole exercise was not to say what code is better than, if, if there is one code better than the other, but was really to compare what the scientific conclusions would be from each of these codes and and so what are the uncertainties in the model What we should account for when uh, we derive our scientific conclusions? Next slide. So now I will show you um, a plot of star formation rate versus stellar mass for all the codes. And um, just to remind you what we are looking at when we look at the star formation rate stellar mass uh, plot. Next slide. We will look at uh, the scatter in the relation because it tells us about the stochasticity of the star formation history in the galaxy. Next slide, we'll look at the slope and the normalization. 
because it looks like it, it tells us about um, the specific star formation rate basically of, of the population. Uh, massive galaxies tend to have lower specific star formation rates than uh, low mass galaxies that are in a more active phase. So the slope is, could be one and then turn turn over at the massive end. And the last, uh, the go, next slide, sorry and the locus and distance of the quiescent uh, phase. Uh, next slide. So here you can just keep pressing Sundar for at least three clicks, I think. <laughs> OK, back one. Uh, these are main sequences for the same galaxies, uh, the same uh, 300 galaxies at Redshift 1, but interpreted from different codes. So you see the differences are striking. There are There is a lot of difference. And each of these codes would interpret the scientific return, uh, would, would give the scientific interpretation in a different way, in terms of scatter, slope, um, um, normalization and locus of the quiescent galaxies. Uh, the um, specific star formation rate line of zero is just for reference to guide the eye. It's the same in every plot. Next slide. This is the rest of the codes. Again, differences. But not all is lost because we know that all these codes um, actually uh, had reasonable approaches. So we can take the median, next slide, of all these measurements and have a fiducial uh, star formation rate stellar mass diagram from which we can drive our conclusions. But more importantly, next slide, we can quantify the uncertainty due to the models. So for example, if we look at the spread in uh, the parameters from the different codes, um, this is what is plotted here as the spread in stellar mass for every galaxy as a function of the median stellar mass for every galaxy. You can see that the spread is around 0.12 dex for some galaxies larger, for some galaxies is lower. But this tells us that at least the uncertainty in mass has to be 0.1 dex and this 0.1 dex should be added in quadrature to the uncertainty we found with an individual model. And for star formation rate, the picture is a little more uncertain. Uh, the um, median is about 0.3 dex. So we can't go better than 0.3 dex in stellar mass with this specific data set. And for low mass gala low star formation rate galaxies, the uncertainty tend to be much larger. Um, so this is a little flow chart that I'm including in the paper to try to guide uh, people on how to approach a CD fitting in this area era where um, a CD fitting is more of an art. It's, it's, it can't be done in black box anymore. We really need to think through what the data set is, what the models are, what are the ingredients that we need to include, if the priors we are assuming are good or not, if the information is actually in the data, so how um, we should interpret the, the final results. Next slide. So please don't use CD fitting tools blindly. Um, the, we have two good data now. It's not like this poor dude who has only one data point. <laughs> we do have more than that, and we can do better than uh, than just using a black box. Uh, yeah. So next. So just in case I haven't <laughs> convinced you yet, really, why should I care? Um, well, because with these more um, state-of-the-art and more complex models, we can go beyond just measuring masses and star formation rates. We can really now look at the star formation histories of galaxies. And so, next. So, this is my favorite topic, the star formation history reconstructions. And I've done these in, in different flavors and with different data sets. I'll show you just one uh, that was done uh, recently using next uh, candles galaxies um, so i i took the candles uh, data set it it in good south and good north that are very comparable in terms of um, uh, depth and uh, wave band yeah, coverage well, so you, the, the and i took stuff. galaxies between redshift yeah, point two and two point one and i selected and just the quiescent galaxies because i wanted to see how their star um, formation history how their star formation histories are so next step for every galaxy it's not, is it uh, sorry next 
for every galaxy, I can uh, feed the SCD and derive a star formation history. And this star formation history is the combination, the weighted average, weighted by the probability to match the data. I think my eagle is landing. Uh, the um, average uh, star formation history is the combine uh, is the combination uh, of all the star formation histories in the model weighted by their probability to the, the, their ACD match matches the data. And this is what you're seeing here. So this is look back time as a function uh, as story star formation rate as a function of look back time. The zero is observation, and the high uh, high giga years are back in the past. So you can see that all the individual star formation histories from the models are very stochastic, they jump up and down, but from photometry, we don't have the resolution to infer all these uh, spikes and all that stochasticity. So what we see is more of a broad evolution for these galaxies, the, when is the bulk of the mass, when the bulk of the mass is formed. And, and this is the solid line and the dashed lines are the confidence ranges. So I can do that for all the 80, 800 galaxies in the sample. Next. And, um, and so I can combine galaxies in groups of redshift and stellar mass and, and look at how the shapes changing, changing the redshift and the stellar mass. And here I'm showing you just one redshift beam and one stellar mass beam. On the left, the same plot as before is the star formation rate as a function of look at time. Um, next showing also two individual so galaxies. So how that confidence range is built by having some variety in there, in that sample. And on the right side, I'm showing you the metallicity history, because as I said, when you use the star formation histories from simulations, you get for free the metallicity history, which is very important and it's very um, realistic. So it, it shows it's it's expected it's physically expected that the first stars will be metal poor and uh, by the time the galaxies has grown the, the metallicity has increased next next slide this is the conclusion of the paper in cartoon form um, you can see that uh, i divided the beams into high mass high redshift high mass, low redshift, and low mass, low redshift. There is no low mass, high redshift because the sample uh, was not complete. It will be with future telescopes, but from, from this survey, we don't have that. But if we look at the high mass, which means 10 to the 11 high redshift, which is redshift two, we see that the average star formation history is something that rises and falls very quickly. And this is kind of um, expected because that's, what that's the time given by the universe at that age. Uh, the universe is young. So for a galaxy to be quiescent, it has to um, rise fast and, and quench fast. But I want to put fast in quotes here because we, are, we don't know exactly the dynamical time of the universe at those ages or um, maybe processes are normally fast at those ages. So this could be just a normal quenching mechanism. If we look at low redshift instead, we find that galaxies tend to use the whole range they have uh, for forming and quenching. And we, we find that high mass galaxies tend to form fast, reach a peak early, and then um, their star formation rate tends to uh, slowly decline on average. This is always on average. While low mass galaxies, their star formation rate tend to rise slowly, reach a peak late in their life, and then quench fast. And this suggests that there are two different quenching mechanisms for high high mass galaxies and low mass galaxies. And here we are really interpreting the individual star formation histories of galaxies and put them together later, not creating a, a combined sample of galaxies and then derive their evolution. So it's a different approach in looking at uh, the star formation history of the universe. Next slide. So uh, this, this really covered uh, the space of science that uh, I, I'm interested in, that I do, some of the work, you sh I showed you some of the work I've done with some students, some brilliant students. Um, and now for the next 10 minutes or so, I'll, I'll dive into um, so you, you the work that so I do for my functional so work for JWST. I'm an instrument scientist. 
yeah. and I work on NIRI. So part of it is also for supporting commissioning of JWST, but the majority so of it is for supporting the data analysis tools, and which basically means helping the community um, answer, helping the community go through the process of taking raw JWST data and get to the best science products. Next. So we have a few steps for that. The first step is the JWST calibration pipeline, uh, which is really going from the raw data, removing all the telescope effects and extracting uh, the data um, calibrated. So there, are, there is documentation, uh, the, the packages on, on GitHub is available. It's, uh, you can even pip install it now. It's uh, it's next there. August, it's I'm still sorry, in development, sorry, but it's I there. And August, the documentation uh, tell us okay, a lot about okay, the pipeline okay, products, understand so, the outputs uh, of the different steps, the file formats, the header okay. keywords, uh, the mod specific features, and also as on uh, read the docs, but also on the JWST um, documentation on JDocs you can find articles on how to customize and run it yourself because you can also get the data already run through the pipeline, but for some specific modes, you might want to recalibrate them yourself. So there will be, there are some and there will be more instructions on when uh, you would want to recalibrate your data and how to do that. Next. The other part is after you have your data calibrated, you want to um, visualize them and um, work with them. So it's all built in Python. And the two main libraries uh, we are working on are um, affiliated packages uh, of AstroPy, for tutels, especially for photometry, and specutils, especially for, for spectroscopy. And we are really aiming in translating into Python uh, some of the functionality that people have been using for a, for a very long time in IRF or in IDL. The other package is uh, the JDAVs package, which is a package for quick loop visualization of uh, the of the data. And the last the last bit is Jupyter notebook tutorials. So we are, with the help of all the scientists at SCSCI, we are writing Jupyter notebooks that start from a, a scientific use case and use these libraries and these visualization so tools to run through the steps that would be needed to go from the data to um, a scientific result. And these are meant to be tutorials. Oh, please go. Uh, so just to give you a glimpse of what SpecUtils is, um, there are functions so anyway, uh, uh, to read uh, so JWST pipeline outputs, um, uh, then the usual selecting regions, free something the spectra, smoothing uh, the spectra. There are all functions that uh, back in the days you would have had to code yourself. Um, then now they're one-liner, they're coded already. And of course, uh, not everything is adapted to every use case, but that's also the point of having uh, libraries in development. You can always submit a ticket saying, look, this is what I would really like, or I would really need, or this doesn't work for my use case. And, and we can work on that. Uh, we Maybe have template fitting, redshift estimation in, in two different ways, continuum fitting, line fitting. So just for Next. for us. So I'll tell you a little bit more of, um, about JDAVs, which is the visualization uh, visualization tool. So I, I, it, it's based on, on a Jupyter platform as well. It's based on Python. It uses libraries, AstroPy, SpecUtils, and it's uh, it's flexible. It can be embedded in different yeah. workflows, and it's designed to work so in a Jupyter notebook or and, in a standalone desktop application if you like to go click by click or it, it can also be it is also embedded into website like mast for example uh, mast is the archive for for so, data yeah, so that there are hsd data on mast and, and other data and there will be all of jwst data on mast the so the mast web page will have uh, jw J, jdavs built in so you can quick look your data before downloading them and this comes in three preset configurations, uh, SpecViz for 1D spectra, and this is the um, screenshot that I'm showing here. I'm showing a low resolution spectrum where I um, mask 
I selected two emission lines, I masked them so that I could fit the continuum with a linear fit. And everything can be done with the plugins that are included in the in this visualization tool. The other is MOSPIS, so for multi-object spectroscopy. And this comes yeah, with uh, an image viewer, that, uh, a 2D uh, and 1D uh, spectral viewer, and a table to go through your, uh, your MOS data. Like and CubeVis to visualize like cubes, Lloyd. where you have it's three uh, image viewers that uh, visualize the, the cube sliced in wavelength. The uncertainty, if you want, or the DQR, the um, um, quality array, uh, you can change what you visualize there. And then a 1D viewer uh, to visualize the a specific region maybe or or a smooth spectrum from the full cube next so the last uh, of the ingredients here what we are um, we are developing at space telescope is the jwc data analysis notebooks as i said they are meant to be tutorials uh, they showcase okay. the libraries and the visualization Great. tools, and Thanks. they also serve to uh, so inform the development of new features, because if a scientist go through the, uh, their the workflow, they, they can get to a point where they say, well, I really like this function, and they can write it in the notebook so that um, our developers can then build that functionality uh, that uh, the scientist asked for. And we delivered 15 notebooks so far, and they are for different modes and for different instruments on GWST and for different modes of the different instruments. This is just a screenshot of the uh, page on JDocs where you can see four uh, notebooks that um, are related to, to near spec, the near spec instrument. And some use uh, GWST simulated data, some use other data because the specific GWST simulated data were not available yet when the notebook was developed. Next. Uh, the last, the last piece of uh, this whole data analysis uh, framework is the J webinar. So I'm leading the the committee uh, to organize these webinars, a series of webinars to uh, show the community JWST data reduction and analysis and teach the community JWST data reduction and analysis. And so this series will start at the end of April, and registration for it will will be out about mid March. There's a series of virtual and interactive webinars that will cover how um, we we'll cover the pipeline, we we'll cover the data analysis tools, and uh, more mode-specific and use case-specific um, workflows. And the objective is to give a hands-on experience, really on the code, but also offer it live during the webinar, but also offer the material offline and recordings, and um, so that everybody can get up to speed at their own pace. Um, we want to reach a large fraction of the community and not just people who will have their own uh, data, but also people who will want to use publicly available data like data from the early release science programs uh, or some of some geo programs will have uh, their data public right away. So the community who wants to use publicly available data. Uh, next. These are um, a if you can, um, if Sundar will share the slides, I don't know how it works, but if that's the case, you have a bunch of links here that were, that you can use to reach um, all I showed you now about JWC data analysis tools. Next, so uh, my conclusions. Next, here they are. So. Um, we, we saw how we can learn about galaxy formation connecting populations globally or studying the histories of individual galaxies by looking at by studying the information um, in the fossil records in the in the data and the modeling assumptions that we make have an impact on the conclusions we derive so we need to do the best we can in modeling uh, uh, the the in modeling SCDs so that we can interpret the data, but also account for modeling uncertainties. And um, with proper models and good good data, we can actually reconstruct the star formation histories of individual galaxies and look at um, the, the full history of a galaxy, not a combination of different populations of galaxies. And uh, I showed you, uh, I went with a quick showcase of uh, how, uh, what we are developing at STSCI for JWST. 
And I'll leave you with a citation of a quote, sorry, a quote of Julian Del Canton um, about galaxy evolution. She said that in Romeo and Juliet, it is not just boy and girl meet, parents don't approve, boy and girl die. There is much more than that. And that's the same for galaxies. Thank you. Thank you very much, Kami. Uh, that was just visual chocolate. Um, it's very rare to see presentations that have that demonstrate the uncertainties in modeling as well. Um, uh, I will ask people to raise their hands for questions. You can go back one slide so that the conclusions are there in case people find the inspiration on that. <laughs> Ah, we have uh, Bernardo. Go ahead. Camille, thanks for your talk. Very interesting the work Thank you are doing. Uh, I, I was wondering about your uh, study with Woods uh, galaxies. Uh, do you have enough galaxies to see um, um, the, the morphologies of quenched galaxies in your sample? And like uh, not only uh, divide them by stellar mass, but look at, for example, the presence of bars, or even to explore the local environment of them and see if the star formation history changes dramatically or not. Yes, that, that would be... Um... That, that would be an awesome follow-up project. Uh, the, the resolution with HST is actually enough, at least up to Redshift 1.5 uh, for the massive galaxies, because uh, beyond that, especially for the low mass galaxies, it's just blobs. Mm -hmm. um, so JWST will be revolutionary in that, in that area for sure, to see really the morphology well. But there are ways of quantifying the morphology. Um, um, I haven't done myself the, the correlation between morphological characteristics and the submission histories that I found, but I agree that that would be that would be a very nice a very nice follow up. Maybe we should keep in touch. I'm very interested on that. <laughs> I'd love that. I I I'd love to share uh, my results and people take them and <laughs> and run more analysis on those. It actually uh -huh. happened with uh, another work that I did uh, with SDSS galaxies. So I fit the staff mission histories of a large fraction of SDSS galaxies. And then somebody else, Rory Smith, uh, took that, that catalog and um, looked for correlation in clusters mm -hmm. and, see, and saw that um, early uh, galaxies that infall early in their clusters have the earliest star formation histories. So there was that signature, uh, even um, we've been looking in clusters. Thanks. Thanks, Bernardo. Uh, Gustavo? Hi, Camila. It's very nice to see you here, even remotely. It would have been so nice to be there. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I have a question. I was a little bit late uh, for the talk. Maybe you already said this, but the all these people were not using the same uh, population synthesis models, right? The majority were using uh, your models, okay. uh, but not all of them. Not, um, all of them. not all of them. So that that is definitely uh, in something to take into account because it's a systematic that should be taken into account uh, for the ever for the average uh, for the median plot that I showed the star formation rates that are mass I did remove the the one run with Pegas for example because it was systematically off the others that were um, more similar I kept in the in the median but that that can be a source of uh, systematic uncertainty okay thank you thank you thanks Gustavo we have uh, Will hi um, well, Henny, and that was a, a beautiful talk. I enjoyed it very much. I'd like to ask a question about your the last part about the the tools. So they 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 look like they're going to be they're going to be great for JWST data. And I was wondering how specialized are they? I mean, how do you do you hope that people will be using using these tools for other data sets other than JWST, or are they just specialized to that? No, no, they should be open for for um, other data as well. They are. It's possible mm -hmm. to load many different types of data. 
Um, they are specialized for JWST just because JWST is so specialized that needs more than other uh, other instruments. Just just the pipeline outputs, uh, they need uh, the ASDEF format or the GWCS instead of WCS. But mm -hmm. but the basic um, is there, okay. and they can definitely be used for other data sets. Mm -hmm. So any anything that has a like a, a, a data queue, a spectral data queue. Yeah. Could be used the spectra and you, you 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 talked very much about different uh spectral data types is there an, is there also going to be um some specialized tools for studying image images as well yes we are working on it it's just not ready yet but it should be in the next six months we are working on an invis uh, so the okay. image visualization tool uh -huh. so that yes, will that come sounds too. great i I'm looking forward to playing with all this. Oh, that would be great. Uh, feel free to reach out to me if if you need more information or if you hit a wall <laughs> when trying yeah. it. Thank you. Thanks, Will. Uh, we have a My question pleasure. from Luis Felipe. Hi. Uh, nice, not, not very nice uh, uh, talk. M my question is related to uh, all the objects. Uh, do you? Do you know if uh, if quasars, these quasars that have been found at C of seven, already have those present day abundances, or you really haven't looked much into this? Not much, unfortunately. Quasars are not really in my uh, <laughs> near near me, let's say. <laughs> um, so I haven't I haven't looked into that. Sorry. No, it's okay. Thank you very much. My pleasure. Thank you, Luis. Any other questions? Okay, if not, I, I have one question. Uh, this was about, uh, in one of the slides, I think one of your students, uh, uh, part of the legacy program, uh, had accounted also for supernova dust destruction. But uh, at least from what I've read the uncertainty in supernova dust destruction is huge. And there was just a single line there. So do you have any thoughts on that? No, absolutely. This, um, this is, um, Pipit put the machine uh, from Candles, not really uh, Legacy. She's in the Candles collaboration, but um, she's she built in the machinery during her PhD to account for dust evolution, dust formation, destruction. And of course, there is a lot of uncertainty that needs to be taken into account. This was an example, maybe I didn't say it, this was one example Milky Way light galaxy in, in the library. Um, what she has, what the rest of the paper, there are a lot of diagnostic diagrams with all the galaxies in the, in the semi-analytical model uh, with dust and without dust and and see how they move in the various diagnostic diagram compared to observation. So there is indeed a large scatter there. And there are other things that need to be taken into account, like the, the uh, growth of the grains uh, or the distribution of grain size. Um, so there is more work to do there for sure. And But it's, we found that it's very important to account for that, especially for the cooling. It changes the picture. Okay, thanks. Any Thank other you. questions? If not, let's uh, thank Kami again. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Uh, yes, uh, you mentioned uh, I will be uh, passing the PDF on to. So we share not just the video, but also the PDF on the website. So yeah, we will have that. As okay, well. great. Thanks. No, this was exciting. I mean, uh, it's I, it very rare for me to see something with uncertainty, anyone, <laughs> especially <laughs> modeling. And uh, yeah, it's 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 important for people to see that if there's a one decade uncertainty, then you know your one single line doesn't mean anything. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> the January season is where where it's at. Yeah, so that's good. Yeah. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Thank you, and nice to meet you all. Okay, well, uh, have a good afternoon, everyone. And we'll see you next Thursday. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.